So now it's it's uh, it's two past uh, past four. I think uh, we we can start. So this is the second session uh, of that conference uh, focused on the political project for the EU dealing with the kind of of public policy or public action we need for the European Union. Because as you all know, the conference on the future of Europe will not not only deal with institution but also with the content, with the priorities of the EU, maybe new policies or a new balance between, uh, between policies. To address uh, or continue to address that issue, we have today two paper givers and, and three, and three uh, uh, discussants. So as paper givers, we'll have Josephine Van Zeben discussing the Green Deal, and then Amandine Crespi discussing social policy and market economy. And then those contributions will be discussed by a panel made of Dirk Büchler, Ben Smulders, and Alexander Schuster. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to uh, Josephine Van Zeben. She is professor and chair of the law group of, at the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. She has been a lecturer at the ETH in Zurich, and uh, her research focuses on the regulation of environmental issue by public and private actors across jurisdiction. Uh, she has massively published on environmental issues, on the Paris Agreement, on European uh, uh, emission trading scheme, and transnational climate law. And she has a, a presentation titled The European Greed Deal, The Future of Europe? Question mark. Very good question. So I leave you the floor, Josephine, for a presentation between 10 and 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Costa, and, and, and thank you also uh, for the organizers of putting together such an interesting uh, and, and exciting um, program today. I think I should be able to share my screen with you, um, but I'm waiting just for a second for the IT to give me that, um, that power, as it were. Um, because otherwise, yes, I, I do have that now. One second. Okay, um, you should be able now to see my presentation, is that correct? Fantastic, good. Um, so the specific issue that I was asked to address in my presentation relates to the implications of the Green Deal in specifically the context of the planned conference on the future of Europe. Now to me, the link between these two initiatives is a really natural one as both represent, um, in my view, vitally important steps in future-proving the European Union. That said, the complexity and scope of both of these initiatives pose real challenges to their, to their successful implementation. So in this brief talk, what I will try to do is highlight a few important connections between the Green Deal and the Conference on the Future of Europe, and what I consider to be shared challenges to their success. And I will conclude with a few recommendations regarding the issues that should be addressed before the, the start of the conference in order to safeguard its, its effectiveness. Now, as many of you will know, the aims of the Green Deal are very ambitious, and so far that achieving them will require a rethink of most of our economic processes. So the Green Deal looks to create a modern, resource efficient and competitive economy with no net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, where economic growth is decoupled from resource use. At the same time, whether this aim is actually ambitious enough to make the sort of climatic and environmental difference that will ensure the preservation and restoration of our environment remains an open question. So achieving this multifaceted aim will require an economy-wide reform, touching on important climatic and environmental aims. Sadly, it's impossible to provide a meaningful overview of all the sectors and initiative affected by the Green Deal. As you can see, some of the slides, some, some of the slides is, is dedicated to this. Um, but I'd be very happy to answer concrete questions on specific issues in the Q&A and also trust that my learned colleagues in the uh, discussion will reflect on some of these issues as well. Now, the way in which the Commission has proposed to achieve the Green Deal's goals implicate additional changes and innovations beyond these climate and environmental policy changes. There's a heavy reliance on technology, specifically on digitalization, in the proposed measures, a topic which was also addressed earlier today by Professor Venda. And perhaps even more importantly, the distributive and welfare effects of the Green Deal are meant to be shared equitably among economic and industrial sectors, European regions, and also the different dem demographics within the EU. In the words of the Commission, there's supposed to be a just transition into this new competitive economy. Now, while these themes are not new within the EU's internal market narrative, 
um, the scale of the challenge arguably is. So I very much look forward to listening to Dr. Crosby's contribution, who will speak in more detail to the perceived tensions that we see between solidarity and competition in the EU's market. Finally, the Green Deal will also impact on the EU's global position on the uh, position positions on the issues that it raises. So this is already starting to become clear when we look at international negotiations, but also bilateral agreements with third countries. Now here, a particular note, I think, is the effect on the EU's relationship with our closest neighbors, for example, through the energy economy, something, uh, sorry, the, the, ener the energy community, something which I imagine Professor Vishla will comment on as well. Now, given the range of issues that the Green Deal addresses, it's not surprising to see that its topics are also those that have been flagged as the topics of the key debates within the Conference on the Future of Europe. Now, while these, these topics have not been set in stone, on the slide, for instance, I highlighted a couple of things that have been emphasized by the European Parliament, but maybe not by the European Council as potential uh, topics for debate. Um, it's hard to imagine a policy document that is connected to more of these potential topics than the Green Deal. Now, on a more um, organiza organizational and formalistic uh, uh, point of view, the key organizational principles of the conference, as, ex as expressed in the position papers by the European Parliament and the Council, as published in January and June, of, and June of 2020, they also relate back to issues raised in the Green Deal, specifically the Green Deal's commitment to public participation and indirectly the kind of themes that we see in the Just Transition. So what do these substantive and functional commonalities mean for the role of the Green Deal with respect to the Conference on the Future of Europe? On the one hand, we see considerable potential due to the overlap in the issues, participants, um, and processes between the Green Deal and the conference. This means that this could be a key area in which the dialogue, participation, and ownership flagged this morning by uh, President Sassoli um, could become a reality. On the other hand, it's not a given that these overlaps will actually result in synergies. And in order for this uh, to ensure that this will be the case, we have to ensure that the interaction between the Green Deal and the conference is one of constructive feedback rather than a crowding out effect. A note where the example of, for instance, is crowding out would be the potential role of the Climate Pact, which was launched under the Green Deal last year. Now, the Climate Pact could be a really powerful first step in mobilizing the public, and it's, but it's unclear whether its initiatives will in any way link back to the conference and vice versa. Finally, in considering the public participation processes of both the Green Deal and the conference, representative participation is really crucial. The potential pitfall here is how to ensure that, the, that this participation does not revert to mere attendance or presence. So moving forward, what are the most important issues to clarify in order to ensure the potential of both of these initiatives? First, I believe that the scope of the Green Deal and the Conference on the Future of Europe require further requires for further clarification. Specifically, this ambition of covering everything triggers the risk of discussing nothing in any meaningful detail. Now, on the bright side, I think we can say that the age of complacency, as mentioned by Professor uh, Guevara earlier today, with respect to the issues in the Green Deal and indir indirectly also those in the conference, is firmly behind us. On the not so bright side, the scope of the challenge make it seem impossible to address these issues effectively and or comprehensively, especially in the face of the transboundary externalities that were mentioned earlier today by Professor Garvin. Therefore, I believe that the agenda of the conference could benefit from more direction, which does not, in my view, conflict with the ambition of a wide ranging and free flowing debate. Second, additional thought must be given to the participants of the conference especially when it comes to those most implicated in the just transition and the distributive effects of the Green Deal. Now, an open question here is the participation of stakeholders outside of the EU who were also profoundly affected by the forcing uh, transformation. And this, this is something arguably that also is lagging from the, from the Green Deal itself, because even though the EU emphasizes its role as a global leader, it doesn't necessarily meaningfully address how the changes to the European economy will affect those further down the supply chain that actually supplies the European uh, European economy outside of the EU. Now, finally, additional clarification, I believe, is needed regarding the conference's outcomes and how the expected report to the Council and the recommendations to the Parliament may be reflected in the Green Deal and the EU's regulatory agenda more generally. 
This morning, Professor Sassoli argued that we shouldn't restrict our ambitions for these outcomes by already specifying their eventual shape and form. Now, while I agree with this goal for flexibility and creativity, I'm also concerned that lack of commitment and clarity could obscure the impact of the conference's debate. I'll leave it at that. I very much look forward to your thoughts and questions in the Q&A, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that very, very sharp uh, presentation. Uh, the Green Deal has a bit disappeared behind the COVID, uh, but it's still on the agenda and the conference is certainly an occasion to relaunch it and maybe also to give it all the, the, the needed legitimacy to really provoke the changes uh, that, uh, that we need and, and that uh, will have a huge impact on other policies. Uh, let's now give the floor to uh, Amandine Crespi. Welcome, Amandine. Amandine is Professor of Political Science at Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, she's a researcher at the CEVIPOL and the Institute for European Studies in Brussels. Uh, she's also a visiting professor from the Paul Department at the College of Europe. Uh, she has extensively researched and published on the EU and more specifically on resistance to European integration, a European Union social policy, and macroeconomic regulation and she will be, dis be discussing a bit the two those two elements in a presentation which is titled can sharp be proved wrong maybe making the eu a competitive social market economy in times of covid19 amandine you have 10 to 15 minutes thank you so much good afternoon uh, everyone and thank you so much for the invitation i'm really glad uh, to have the opportunity to discuss all, all those very important issues with you um, today. So I see that I can now share my slides. I have also prepared a presentation in the hope of sustaining everybody's attention. It's been a, a day of a, with a wealth of presentation and discussions. So you should be able to see my slides now. And on the title here, Fritz Schaff doesn't appear anymore. He, he will pop up again in the presentation. But as you can see, I have emphasized uh, in italics the term social. Um, so this presentation is about the EU as a competitive social economy. So why emphasizing the social dimension? Um, the social deficit of the EU, social issues um, at EU scale has come back very much at the forefront of the EU's agenda over the past few years. Um, with a number of initiatives, the European uh, Pillar of Social Rights, uh, but also more recent uh, initiatives for fair minimum wages that you may uh, have heard of. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. So um, on the one hand, we've had long term, uh, an, a long term increase in social inequality uh, in European societies, and that is not new. And in addition, of course, um, the, the financial and debt crisis from, from 2008, um, 2010 has also uh, aggravated the situation um, with the recession, but also the austeritarian response. Um, and this has fed into the idea that the EU was not only part of the solution, but also part of the problems. Um, so, a, a fairly wide consensus, consensus has crystallized across disciplines, um, a number of colleagues uh, in law, in political economy, uh, political science, um, and also political theory have explained the many factors and the many perspectives in which um, this social deficit of the European Union um, uh, manifests um, itself. And uh, very famously, Fritz Schaaf claimed back in 2009 that the EU could not be a social market economy. So what is at stake um, over 10 years later is to prove him wrong. Um, can, can we do that? And obviously there is a very uh, particular momentum, uh, both from an economic and from a political point of view to do that. Um, and with regard to the conference uh, on the future of Europe, um, this should be an important focus um, on, on the social uh, issues because we see sustained citizens' demands for more integration in the social realm. I would argue in contrast to what is often assumed in political debates. Um, and as Sasha Garbin reminded this morning, um, a number of polls and, and surveys and scientific research show 
um, that social issues remain have remained at the top of citizens' concerns. But not only that, also majorities express themselves in favor of more EU instruments for tackling, for instance, unemployment, um, inequality and discriminations. So um, I um, have no doubt that this will be a, an issue that the Conference on the Future of Europe will, um, will pick on. Now, trying to um, establish a diagnosis on a competitive social market economy, uh, we know that achieving a high level of welfare, uh, but also a fair distribution in a way through this concept of social cohesion, have long been objectives, key objectives of EU integration back, um, back to, to the Treaty of Rome. Um, but at the same time, we see that um, the um, that social cohesion has been at the heart of political struggles, also between proponents of a more um, liberal e economy and, and uh, proponents of a more regulated economy. And these aspects were also at the heart of the uh, last uh, very important constitutional moment uh, of the EU uh, between 2000 and 2005. And eventually this um, term, a highly competitive social market economy was introduced into um, the Lisbon Treaty. Now, is this a contradiction in terms? Um, I try in the paper to unpack without going too much into um, the economics of all that, to unpack this, this relationship. Uh, a problem uh, in political debates has often been an implicit, uh, yet very present, narrow focus on cost competitiveness when considering competitiveness which amounts to make uh, social regulation, social rights more of a hindrance vis-a-vis -vis competitiveness. Now, in reality, if you look at um, a, a lot of uh, research in economics, also research conducted by international organizations such as the OECD, uh, very clearly competitiveness and social cohesion uh, go hand in hand. Uh, for example, um, we see that uh, competitiveness depends uh, to a large extent on the existence of performance, not only physical, but also social infrastructures, uh, and that ambitions to develop a knowledge economy um, also rely on education, uh, investment and training, research and development, and so on. A further problem has been that um, debates on competitiveness more often than not have focused on measuring and comparing levels of competitiveness of national economies between themselves rather than looking for um, policies and concepts for boosting um, the competitiveness of the EU as a whole. So uh, where does this leave us? Um, to the argument that we need uh, an almost philosophical shift and certainly an institutional shift for asserting the role of the EU in what should be seen as a European multi-layered um, competitive social market economy. And let me explain a little bit um, as I move on to the recommendations. So the first part of my recommendations um, has to do with strengthening the normative foundations of uh, a competitive uh, social market economy. And by normative foundations, I mean both in more um, philosophical value terms, but also in institutional terms. The point of departure is that the role of the EU in the socioeconomic realm uh, remains both contentious and incomplete. Uh, we see, if we look at the treaties, we have scattered competences across uh, specific policy areas uh, with a strong uh, bias towards single market policies. Healthcare is a good example in that regard. Um, and of course, we've seen across the board political resistances to increasing the competences of the EU, sometimes um, counterproductive defense on a national sovereignty. We see that a lot um, from um, uh, Scandinavia and from other member states, to a lesser extent, uh, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, and we see also a democratic deficit uh, in the sense that we still need uh, a crucial 
uh, increased uh, parliamentary involvement, especially in everything that regards soft coordination. And I'll come back to that later on. So a first recommendation would be to focus a democratic debate for acknowledging and perhaps specifying even the role of the EU along three dimensions. First, the dimension of national cohesion. And this turn is taken, so to a very large extent, you see that those three dimensions reflect what the EU is already doing, but sometimes without uh, a clear, uh, let's say, formalization or consensus having crystallized. With the recovery facility, we do towards uh, a range of um, uh, instruments and funds which are going to be distributed to uh, improve, to enhance national cohesion. International cohesion between the member states, so not within, uh, only within European societies, but among European societies, is also an important um, dimension. Uh, and here the EU needs to keep on tackling the differentiated risks and burdens um, that exist among the member states when you look at different policy areas, for instance, the green transition, uh, but also migrations, also monetary integration, uh, and so forth and so on. And thirdly, the transnational cohesion. Um, solidarity and equality among individual European citizens. We have a European citizenship which still lacks a substantial social dimension. Uh, and um, the European Pillar of Social Rights for that um, sets the ambition to uh, reach a set of effective and binding rights uh, for European citizens. So I'm now moving on um, further to policy agendas and policy is issues to try and um, assert um, this role of the EU in a multi-layered um, competitive social market economy. Obviously, we currently have an important, perhaps historic even, window of opportunity which also brings with it um, the um, accumulation perhaps of a number of governance frameworks and procedures which remain uh, opaque, uh, complex to a certain extent. So we now have this recovery facility uh, which relies on distribution mainly, which will be coupled to the European semester, which um, at its origins uh, relies mainly on a monitoring logic. And at the same time, the European pillar of social rights should also be coupled uh, or streamlined into the European semester. And again, it, relay, it relies on a bit of a different logic, uh, on a rights logic. And um, as uh, the first presentation has shown, obviously, the European Green Deal also provides for a very uh, a leading, very important agenda, and it's still unsure how the social dimension will articulate to this um, very uh, central um, ambition. Now, if we go back to the three dimensions, um, which I have identified in a previous slide, uh, what can be done, what should be done? In terms of national cohesion, um, an agenda for boosting social investment should be key. Um, the, the concept, the agenda has been already around for a few years, but the EU has not, has yet to develop a consistent, systematic and tangible agenda, which now is very interesting, can be coupled to resources through the recovery facility, which wasn't the case earlier. And that's very important because it means you don't only give the member states obligations and rules, but you also provide for resources. Regarding international cohesion, um, building, keep on building collective capacity at EU level is very important. Um, the agenda for a new EU owned resources um, which has been advanced in connection with debt pooling and the recovery facility is really crucial and will be crucial in the years to come. And this agenda should target quite logically the added value of the EU should be asserted uh, on um, transnational activities, bad finance, uh, polluting uh, activities, economic activities, digital business and so on. In terms of transnational cohesion, 
as I mentioned, um, social citizenship at EU level needs to be substantiated. Um, and this can happen through um, the effectiveness of a number of transnational rights, uh, but also going further, breaking the taboo perhaps of individual re redistribution. There are a number of very pressing issues. Some of them are already on the EU's agenda, such as a child guarantee. Um, others are not, uh, but are pressing, like um, the deficit of social security for independent workers. Um, and that could also um, be picked up by, uh, by the EU. To conclude, um, a straightforward message uh, also for the conference, no taxation without representation is an old motto, but um, it should not be uh, uh, forgotten, should be asserted and reasserted yet and again, especially at the EU level. Um, in my view, what we are really witnessing at the moment with the recovery and resilience agenda is a further shift uh, of the EU away from a model of a regulatory state with an EU reaching even further into core state powers with common debt, with potentially new taxes, with a lot of redistribution and with um, endeavors uh, for strengthening social rights. A European competitive social market economy cannot be the product of bureaucratic coordination. Um, and that is what we uh, see a lot at the moment, even executive federalism through governance processes such as the European semester, for instance, uh, which involves mainly um, EU institutions and national administrations, uh, but um, uh, which raises no salience, no debate in national uh, arenas and public spheres. Um, so what is needed here, um, in, in, in my view, would be uh, an effective networked parliamentarism. Uh, we have embryos of that already, uh, but we could think of empowering a committee for European socioeconomic governance, uh, a committee made of both MEPs and MPs with effective, not only control, but also decision making uh, competences. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Amandine, for this brilliant presentation. Uh, I think you're really touching a key issue, which is very central to the political debate and even to people who don't know anything about European integration. And I guess that's the expectation of citizens toward the EU are very high when it comes to, uh, let's say, welfare state and, and, and things like that. So uh, don't forget that there is a question and answer section in, in the WebEx. Feel free to type in your question uh, to question there. We will, uh, all the participants will answer them uh, later. We now have uh, some time for uh, a discussion, 30 minutes for discussion. We have three discussants on the program. Let's give them the floor, uh, seven minutes each, and then come back to our speaker of the day. So three discussants, the first one, is Dirk Büchler. Dirk Büchler is the chairholder of the European Energy Policy Chair at the College of Europe and is also professor within uh, the Department of Political Studies. He's also deputy director of the Europe, uh, the Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. And in Vienna, his job is to ensure the implementation of the European energy law in the country of the community. And he's also responsible for a dispute resolution in the energy sector. He has widely published on uh, different areas of European policies uh, and law, and especially the question of energy, obviously, but also the single market and the ENP. The second speaker uh, who is not with us currently, I'm just checking on that, but uh, he, he's struggling to get there. He, it's Ben Smelder. So in normal conferences, people get stuck in trains or airports and in WebEx conference, they are fighting with computers and software updates. Uh, anyway, I hope that Ben will able, be able to join us. He is a director and principal legal advisor of the Commission uh, Legal Service, heading the trade policy and WTO team. And prior to this, he, he worked as a head of cabinet of uh, Franz Timmermans. He is also a visiting professor uh, of law at the College of Europe and in other universities I will not mention here. 
And Ben Smelder is co-editing the Common Market uh, Law uh, Review, and he has massively uh, published on EU law related subject. And uh, we finally have a third, a, a third discussion who is Alexander Schuster. He's a student in the law department. Um, he's a German national. He studied in University of Groningen before coming at the college, Durham and Maastricht. He has worked a bit in the German Bundestag and at the college he's involved in the EU Fundamental and Human Rights Group. And we also have with us uh, on stage uh, Professor Sasha Garben from the Law Department. And Sasha is in charge of collecting all your questions and, and then uh, uh, asking them to our uh, paper uh, givers a bit later. But now I will give the floor to Dirk for some initial comments and questions to the speakers. And then we'll listen uh, to uh, Alexander and Ben, if he's able to join us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Olivier, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, highly interesting discussion on the future of Europe and, of course, to allow me to make some comments and remarks on the topic of the Green Deal in that respect. Well, it's evident that the Green Deal is one of the mega topics of the current European policy debate. It's the response to a great challenge, uh, climate change, and it is also a chance for Europe to find its new narrative, a Europe that has been ridden by crisis, maybe sometimes even humiliated by crisis. And this now is finally a positive agenda for the next uh, 30 years to come. Is it a topic that will take the backseat at some point in time again, like many other topics uh, have been doing? I don't think so. Um, what we are in is the beginning of a second industrial revolution and this time Europe is not only responding to the abuses of such a revolution. If we all remember the first Paris Agreement of 1951, so the beginning of European integration was essentially a response to how the opportunities offered by the first industrial revolution were abused um, by countries and by powers. Now, the second industrial revolution, the, the one that in Europe is described as a Green Deal, um, has also started with the Paris Agreement, the one from 2015. But unlike um, the, the first one, Europe was at the beginning involved in the Paris Agreement, was one of the driving forces. And I think that is already a very positive uh, beginning. Now, uh, this is a revolution, in my view, where we have crossed the point of no return. Uh, it is a change of our lifestyles, of our lifestyles, of our economies, of our societies, which will literally leave no stone unturned in, in Europe and in everybody's individual life. And it also has a lot of interesting features. The Green Deal that is going to shape that revolution uh, which I believe are relevant for a discussion on the future of Europe. Let me just mention a few. They happen to be features and elements that are normally discussed in the context of statehood. I'm not going to insinuate any, anything here, but it's interesting nevertheless, I believe. Maybe the first one is the control over natural resources. Um, currently, the sovereignty of member states over their natural resources has already, since the beginning of the European energy policy, since the establishment of a common market, since, since instruments like the emission trading scheme have kicked in, eroded to a large extent. If we're now moving to a Green Deal where the European Union is defining or rather limiting the use of nat natural resources, namely by saying you cannot use anything that has carbon in it anymore, I think this process will go faster. The second would be the continent-wide infrastructure. Since Roman times, we know that for the integration of territories, infrastructure is of overriding importance. And we also see that traditionally in Europe, when it comes to energy, when it comes to the sectors relevant for the Green Deal, the infrastructure has evidently been designed on a national basis, in a national architecture. But this is about to be changed. And the trend that has already started beforehand, what kind of infrastructure do we need for the Green Deal? What kind of pipelines do we need for hydrogen, for example? What kind of networks do we need to connect to make sure that we harvest the most of the Green Deal? This is also going to um, be an, a trend that is going to 
become much more European than what we have seen in the past. The next um, element I would see is European industrial policy and by consequence also an economic policy as a feature of the Green Deal. We are talking here about the Green Deal that doesn't happen only in Europe, but takes place in a global context. And in this context, more than before, we become aware that creating national champions is not a way out of um, what actually uh, uh, constitutes a threat. Uh, our lifestyle is not only challenged by the Green Deal or will not only be subject uh, to changes uh, in a positive manner. We have been relying in Europe, for example, on our powerhouses like the car industry. Now, if all the battery production happens in Asia and we can't respond to that, that may actually be affected. And I believe in responding to that challenge in creating European um, champions, maybe in establishing what has been called strategic autonomy, the Green Deal will also actually uh, work as a big boost. Uh, another element uh, which will also be promoted, has been promoted by Green Deal and decarbonization is a European public. When I started taking an interest in European affairs, I always heard, well, there is one problem with Europe, it doesn't have public and publicity. Now, I think um, Ms. Greta Thunberg has changed that also, almost single-handedly by creating a debate, a European-wide and even global debate on where we want to go and giving evidently a lot of support to this policy area of Green Deal and that it got the importance in the EU that it deserves. And the last element I would like to mention here is foreign policy. Just on Monday, uh, the Council adopted uh, conclusions on climate diplomacy. That has been an element which is contributing to rejuvenating European external action, I believe. Everybody, member states, seem to be aligned behind the goals that the EU pursues within the Paris Agreement. And if you look back, and maybe don't have to look back that far, um, how controversial a European external energy policy is and was, just think of uh, controversial pipelines in the Baltic Sea, um, you see that the Green Deal moving um, from energy silos into a broader, more holistic um, climate policy changes a lot also in that respect and helps shaping a new external energy policy. Before I finish, let me just maybe also add on top of uh, Josephine's excellent presentation, a few features of governance that I also believe will contribute and definitely also in the context of the future of Europe discussion will contribute to changing not only sectoral policy in the EU. One is uh, subsidiarity. Uh, the Green Deal borrows a lot of concepts from the Paris Agreement, the second Paris Agreement, the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, instead of our classic Europe commands or sets legislation and then the member states follows, European Union has adopted a policy based on targets and implemented on member states level by plans. I find this a remarkable change in policy given that it is an import from an institution, from an organization like the UN, which is based on unanimity and based on um, a variety of interests all over the globe. Um, and that will also affect the way how Europe on a multi-layer level will be governed in the future. And we will make probably a lot of experience there. Solidarity is an important issue. Um, now we have to make sure that the burden of uh, transiting from what is now to what will be tomorrow is shouldered and is shared in a fair way. This will raise other aspects which will play a big role in the future of Europe debate, such as transfers, such as conditionalities. And I think we can link there to other topics that have been discussed earlier on. Another issue would be um, the care and the um, concern that is given about governance per se. I have not seen an area in European policy where so much focus has been put on the governance as recently in the context of the Green Deal. First, we had the governance regulation 
Now we have even a climate law, which clearly allocates roles and procedures um, for how to get this Millennium Project um, properly managed. We'll have, and Josephine alluded to that, we'll have um, a lot of trade-offs probably to be made. This Green Deal is not just a simple vector on which we will move forward into one direction. Um, Josephine, you referred to a trade-off between market and social issues. There are others as well, even within the objectives, you have trade-offs to be made between climate policy and uh, environmental policy. Think of sustainable biofuels, for example. But the social question, um, and I will finish on that, evidently will take um, the most important role, I believe. It's maybe also a first timer that the concept of justice as expressed in the just transition takes a concept which has been evolved and developed ever since Aristotle takes such a central role in European policy making and is actually addressed um, by financial, but also by um, other instruments that will play a big role in context of Green Deal. So my conclusion would be um, the Green Deal is an expression of the greatest test that the EU went through, but it is also an expression of its uh, greatest possibilities. And I believe that should make uh, and give us an opportunity to reflect and build on in the future of Europe debate. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you there for those very uh, substantive comments. We have at, ne uh, at least questions and points uh, for six more hours of, of discussion. Let's now uh, give the floor to uh, Alexander uh, Schuster. Apparently, Mr. Smelders is not capable to, um, to connect despite the help of the IT people. But uh, never mind, Alexander, you have the floor. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for having me today and for being able to present the, the voice of the young generation on, on this very, very important topic. Uh, I would like to take you on a small journey to um, highlight the importance of the window of opportunity that uh, Professor Crespi um, was, was mentioning. And um, I've prepared this little poster. A school strike for climate, it says. A young girl sitting in front of the Swedish parliament, um, demonstrating for more climate action, holding this piece of paper in her hand. And months later, we can see that one single person has started an entire global movement that has literally moved the, the entire world in every country. And especially in the European Union, we could see people going on the streets every Friday, every week, repeatedly, and asking the governments to, to implement um, measures to tackle the climate crisis, to be more decisive, to, be, to act more swiftly. And we have seen in the European Union that this movement has sort of created a momentum for, for all of us. It has created a demos, which is very, very unique for, for the European Union. And I think this is very important when we, when we discuss the Green Deal. And now we are having this Green Deal. And this Green Deal does not only talk about the ecological transformation, but also um, about an economic transformation, as well as a, a social transformation that we are having. And um, having in mind this momentum that we are having right now, we should not hesitate to actually put this Green Deal into practice. And we could see now during the pandemic, that if there is a will, uh, member states are able to perform uh, all this very, very quickly, to act, act swiftly, to act decisively. And this is exactly what is needed here. Um, I, I would like to uh, start a bit with um, so the, the social policy uh, aspect of, of the Green Deal which I consider is, is very, very important. Especially now during the pandemic, we have seen the, the inequality um, that has even increased over the last month, not only between, between rich and, and poor, where we could literally see that people are, are starving um, on the one hand and others are increasing their wealth tremendously. 
Um, but we could also see already an enormous amount of, of effort from the member states and the union itself to increase the solidarity by introducing common debts, which was unimaginable a few years ago. Um, but now we are having common debts. And, and this solidarity is also very important for the Green New Deal to have a just transition, to take all those countries in the East that are still heavily reliant on coal, for example, to take, to take them with us, to um, help them, to financially support them and um, help them in effectively, swiftly and decisively um, tackle, tackle this, this crisis and perform, perform the change. Another point I would like to mention here, um, which uh, Professor Büschler has, has already uh, touched upon, is the uh, common industrial strategy. And I do think that we should start seeing the European Union as an area, as, as a whole, and also see the internal market as one economic and industrial area. We should move away from these national policies towards a more a common strategy. For example, we are having the, the Green Deal touches upon a common hydrogen strategy. Hydrogen is, is very, very difficult to produce because it requires a lot of energy. So why don't we, together with the Southern European states and with their resources that they have with the energy of the sun, make them produce hydrogen that is that is uh, available to the entire union that supports industries and in all other member states and that makes or enables us to perform this this change swiftly and effectively and another point here is also um that that I would like to mention if we are thinking about the bigger picture and if we are having the ever the idea of the ever closer union in mind i think it is also important to um, not only mention the, the green deal itself but also talk about um, structural reforms in, in general especially if it comes to the internal market especially if it comes to the transformation of our economy we can see that, for example, the worker mobility in, in the EU is just around 4%, whereas we have it at 30% in the US and, and uh, much higher numbers elsewhere. So we need deep reforms to, to get closer together and to take um, this, this window of opportunity that we have, this demos, um, and, and move forward. This includes, for example, own fiscal resources for the union so that it's not dependent on the member or exclusively dependent on the member states anymore, but can also act on its, on its own with its own budget, with its own money, with its own resources. And um, one final point that I, that I would like to, to mention here and that I, that I would like to conclude with is that this window of opportunity that we have created, despite the uh, current priority of the um, COVID pandemic for obvious reasons, but this window of opportunity that we have created might not be here anymore in three, four, five years. This demos is here right now. So we should try as the European Union to become a leader in the transformation of, of economy, of the environment, and of course, as well the social policies and become a leader in the world and lead the way for other countries to follow us. And, and this is not something that is, is up to politicians or that um, my generations by, by going on the street and by demonstrating has created, but this is something that we should or shall and must all need to do together. Um, that means that includes politicians, that includes managers, that includes um, all generations, all different people, because this is something, the climate crisis that concerns all of us. And not only now, but also for the future generations, especially for, for our generation and my children's generations and the, the generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander, and thank you so much for really uh, 
playing the game. I, I mean, we, we really wanted to have one student representative in each panel to have the voice of the young generation. And at some point I was thinking, okay, considering the profile of our students, they're going to be even more technical than professors, but um, this was not the case and this is so great. So let me give the floor back to uh, Josephine and Amandine, and then Sasha will present us a, a certain number of questions coming from the floor. Josephine. Well, let me first uh, express my gratitude to uh, to Derek in, in, in covering a lot of the substantive issues that um, I couldn't possibly have covered in, in, in 10, 15 minutes. Um, but also, I think, raising some additional questions, which I think are really vital to, to the discussion that we're about to have, uh, possibly in the Q&A. Um, because I think um, one of the really uh, difficult things about the Green Deal is that there are indeed um, so many synergies to be had, but also so many trade-offs to be made. And um, I think one of the really interesting things about the Green Deal is that while those trade-offs in some ways might be uh, unavoidable, um, I do think that there is an awareness of a need of policy integration across areas that maybe in the past haven't been integrated in that way. Um, in a way that we haven't seen before. So I think a, a really interesting example of this is the farm to, uh, the farm to fork strategy, where now environmental um, uh, ambitions are being brought into uh, our food system uh, in a very explicit way, which we didn't see before. Now, of course, um, the proof is in the pudding. pudding. So um, one of the issues, of course, is how do we then implement that and how do we follow that through? Also, for instance, in other related areas like uh, the common agricultural policy. And, you know, as, as you will remember from the controversy that we had with the recent um, uh, um, COP uh, reforms, uh, this isn't always yet successful. But I, I think that tension between trade-offs and, 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 and trying to create policy synergies where in the past there weren't any, I think is really interesting. Um, a second point that was raised by Derek was also this uh, question of subsidiarity and uh, the feature of the national plans, which indeed are coming in from Paris. Um, you know, just reflecting really briefly on um, the direction that we saw within the EU in the past uh, few years, for instance, when we think about the European Emission Trading Scheme, actually what we saw there is that um, the Commission had abandoned these national uh, these national plans uh, because they saw that this wasn't actually uh, working uh, very effectively. So I, I agree that this is a hugely interesting change, and I'm very curious to see how what its effect is going to be because I think there there was also potentially. Um, a compromise that was made by uh, by the Commission, which may have been inspired by the international obligations of um, of the European Union, but at the same time also I think speaks to um, some tensions between different member states who have different views on how ambitious and in what kind of way uh, the Green Deal should be implemented. Um, I just want to also really briefly go back to a point that was made um, early on by Olivier about COVID and how the pandemic might um, affect uh, the Green Deal's ambitions, but also the timeline. And um, you know, I think I think Alexander is very right. I mean, we we have this opportunity now, and we might not have it in a few years from now. And I think there is actually a, a widespread awareness of this now. Definitely, as I already mentioned, some member states think about this issue differently than others. And I think some of them have used explicitly the pandemic to say we should abandon the Green Deal, we should get rid of the ETS, we should, you know, there have been those voices. But at the same time, there's also been, I think, quite powerful statements of um, uh, of countries um, saying that we should use the economic recovery that is going to be needed to make it a green recovery and actually tying that all in with um, with the Green Deal. And I agree that this uh, is not a floating, um, sorry, a fleeting um, uh, uh, policy uh, statement or area, but something that will stay, I think, central to the European policy for a long time. And then I guess I wanted to close on a comment, but which is also a bit of a question uh, for Armandine. So maybe she can she could uh, say something about that because I'm very curious about her view on this. Um, I think one of the things that has been very difficult about the Green Deal is that depending on whose perspective you take, um, it's either hugely revolutionary and hugely ambitious or not revolutionary enough and not ambitious enough. And I think one of the main tensions in which we see that is um, whether this is actually a degrowth agenda or whether this is a um, 
continuing continuation of sort of the green growth agenda, but just in a sort of even more critical and ambitious way. And how I read it, I don't think this is an I don't think this is an agenda for degrowth. I actually think that even though there will be lifestyle changes in the end, there's also a very clear message of we can maintain our lifestyle, or at least our quality of life to a certain degree, if we make certain changes in how we um, sustain that that lifestyle, and that that quality of life. Um, so I guess one of the things that I'm really curious about, which I haven't really been able to answer for myself, is how do we do all this and at the same time also deal with this issue, um, which haven't been discussed today explicitly, but I think sometimes is there under the surface, um, that there might be this multi-speed Europe at some point, that not all member states are necessarily keen to make all these changes at the same time. And I think that's very, very clear when we look at the social issues that uh, Armandine was discussing. You know, can we even have a multi-speed Europe if we at the same time are going to have this integrated social market economy? Is, is, that, even, is that even a possibility? Um, so, um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm just really curious what my fellow panelists think about this and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Josephine. Uh, Amandine, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. And I'm so um, thankful um, towards both the organizers and the other speakers to allow us to discuss the social issues and the ecological issues together. This is hugely important. I'd like to take issue with this idea which comes back time and again, this idea that we have trade-offs and especially a trade-off between a green agenda and a social agenda. Um, and I tend to think that this idea of a trade-off is not only very detrimental um, from a political point of view because it threatens the success and popular support for the Green Agenda. But I also, and I'm asking the others because I'm obviously out of my own comfort zone and, and ex area of expertise, but is that empirically grounded? I'm asking the following questions. Are the social costs linked to the extinction of certain polluting activities higher than the costs of the impact and the inequality caused um, by non-managed climate change. Do we know that? Is that empirically established? I'd be very interested to, um, to know that because, as I said, this idea that there is a trade-off is politically very important. Um, in her paper, Josephine, for instance, mentions energy poverty. This is a perfect illustration of uh, an issue where you don't have a trade-off, but you have a conjunction of um, social and ecological concerns. And if you cannot prove or if you cannot convince the citizens that the green agenda will work for them and will also tackle those very problems that they are facing, especially now, as um, Alexander reminded, in the, the COVID times where um, poverty will be even more acute uh, in the years to come, then um, I'm, I'm afraid it will be very, very difficult to, to uh, garner sufficient popular support to, to have actually effective implementation um, on the ground. Um, and one thing that concerns me is that this conjunction between the social agenda and the ecological agenda is weakly uh, conceptualized in the literature, in the policy papers uh, coming from the EU institutions. Um, unless I'm overlooking something very, very important, which is possible, and you'll tell me, but I have the feeling that the main point of operationalization is the Just Transition Fund, which tackles only one aspect of this conjunction, which concerns mainly a kind of bargaining strategy in, you know, for some regions or some economic sectors uh, where some funds will be channeled. But that, you know, the way in which this conjunction between ecological problems and social problems um, intervene at the level of individual lives, individual citizens, uh, through, for instance, issues like energy poverty is not being addressed and is not being um, conceptualized uh, or addressed in any way uh, in the EU agenda. Now, moving on to uh, 
Josephine's very interesting and insightful remark about the ambitions and the nature of this um, Green Deal agenda. Uh, again, from a rather more external, as a non-expert of green uh, policies, I would concur that this is not uh, a degrowth agenda, I think. Very interestingly, the Green Deal and um, the ecological transition have become a new field for ideological struggles. So I think that we see um, different uh, metrics, different concepts and ideas uh, emerging and, and um, perhaps uh, in struggle within each other. Within each other. But I, I am also uh, sometimes concerned that this agenda will be captured by uh, a kind of trend that we can keep on living as we live, we, that societal change is not really re required, that we will have quick fixes in a way um, to um, tackle the uh, damaging uh, aspects of uh, one or the other uh, activity. And finally, on multi-speed Europe, um, I am also skeptical of that concept, not only because it has been possible for a long time um, and it has not really happened, I mean, beyond the already established procedures and the already existing differentiation within the EU, um, but to go a lot further and to have a, a very deep institutionalized multi-speed Europe, I think that uh, from a social point of view, for example, at least two things speak um, against that. And also from an economic point of view, first, the single market is not multi-speed. So every regulation uh, and every important issue uh, concerning the single market has to be EU-wide. And this involves also um, social regulation and social rights. And in so far as, you know, all European citizens have to be regarded equal, entitled with equal rights, I don't really see let's take the example of minimum wages i don't really see how you could possibly enforce you know certain regulations and certain progress um for some countries or some uh, europeans and not the others so in that sense um from from this point of view of competitive social market economy uh, i don't really see how a uh, multi-speed europe could be desirable uh, or feasible Thank you very much for those uh, comments on the comments and answers. Let's move now to Professor Sasha Garben, who has collected some questions coming from uh, from the participants. Indeed. So we have two questions for Amandine, one for Josephine and one mostly for Dirk. And I will sneak in a question of myself for Josephine as well. Uh, but first, the questions for Amandine. Um, first of all, any thoughts about the action plans concerning the European social pillar and the implementing actions thereof for the issues of integration and inclusion? Um, with a remark that it is important to focus on concrete results rather than general principles. Um, so asking for your thoughts, Amandine, on that. And then the second question for you, would the agenda that you set out in your presentation require enlarging the EU budget? Um, is it useful to make estimations of the appropriate level of the EU budget as of a percentage of GDP? Um, then uh, the question I imagine is mostly for Dirk, but obviously any, any of the speakers can come in on any of the questions. But uh, dear participants, do you believe that the current series of events, Green Deal, Next Generation, Renewables and Hydrogen and Taxes for Carbon Polluting Imports, could convince the European Commission to be more open to European champions? Um, then for Josephine, will the Green Deal, well, we have spoken a bit about this, but maybe you can add on to what has been said. Will the Green Deal help to tackle fuel poverty or will we never see a paradigm change? And I myself, Josephine, would be interested if you had time to reflect on whether you feel um, the increased use of fundamental rights litigation in the context of climate change uh, with uh, the watershed urgenda judgment of the, the Hoge Raad, the Supreme Court in the Netherlands, whether you feel that that is uh, a, a very significant development or, or maybe not and, and why. Thank you. So, 
Who wants to start? Josephine, maybe? Sure. Um, so um, I'll very briefly comment on the European champions uh, point, um, because I have to admit that my view on this is, is um, about 60% intuition and 40% actual experience. Um, I, yeah, I think it does. I, I do th I do think there's a, there's more likelihood now of, of the um, European champions. Um, and I think uh, one of the ways in which we can see that is uh, because of the changes that the Commission is pushing for in terms of state aid and comp competition law policy and when it comes to sustainable initiatives. So I think in that sense, if a very strong case were to be made for a European champion that fills that Green Deal agenda, I think I think that is a possibility. Um, so there's there was a question on, on fuel poverty, um, uh, just maybe for clarification's sake. Um, and I assume that this is also what the uh, person asking the question means. Uh, fuel poverty and energy poverty are, are tend to be used as synonymous. So, so they, they speak to the same issue, uh, namely the idea that people have to spend a disproportionate um, uh, amount of their uh, their disposable income on um, on fuel or on energy in order to heat their house or or, or, or drive their cars. Um, and uh, you know, it was it was mentioned before by Armandine that this is maybe one of these areas where. There doesn't necessarily need to be a trade off, but actually there's an overlap in the kind of ambitions that we have. Um, what's really interesting about that, because I don't necessarily disagree with that, but what is really interesting about that is that in other jurisdictions, the, the language of fuel poverty has actually sometimes, uh, and energy poverty has sometimes been used uh, as a sort of backdoor um, entry um, into the regulation of fuel prices, because uh, the, the the Commission's main perspective, also seen in the Green Deal, is the idea that we should prize uh, prize all these uh, commodities uh, accurately or, or higher, um, and um, and thereby give people the, the right or the correct initiative uh, incentives to 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 use less, for instance, um, and. Uh, there are some cynical voices that say actually using energy or fuel poverty as a reason not to uh, price uh, these commodities in a different way um, is actually in favor of the energy um, sector uh, who would like to continue their, their usage. This is a this is a much, much, much more complex question than that, because obviously there are many different ways in which we can um, distribute the the price effects of pricing these resources accurately in a way that does not have to negatively ne negatively impact uh, certain certain populations uh, but just this is just to say that it's a very different a very difficult uh, question which also speaks to things such as home ownership um, uh, the ability of people to actually implement certain for instance energy efficiency um, uh, uh, um, um, elements in their home, which they would otherwise maybe do in order to use less energy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very complex uh, question. Um, so as to the question of will the Green Deal actually help to tackle this, um, that that depends very, very much on what the structure would be of the energy poverty um, uh, regulations and programs that would be adopted. Um, I think what is, uh, however, worth emphasizing is that if we were to abandon um, the incentives to um, use less energy, and this was a question raised by Armandine, um, because we're saying that the social costs of doing so might not be outweighed by the eventual cost of climate change um, uh, or unmanaged climate change, um, one of the big risks of that strategy would be that the people that are currently impacted by energy poverty would also be the people disproportionately impacted by the negative effects of climate change. So basically this group will either be affected very negatively in the now, but also possibly in the later when it comes to adaptation. I think that's that's a very uh, big concern. Um, and then finally, uh, Sasha's question on um, the role of fundamental rights litigation when it comes to these issues, um, again, potentially a huge topic. I think the one thing that I would like to uh, emphasize maybe on this litigation is that what's been quite interesting is that so far that litigation has happened mostly at the national level. And uh, one of the outcomes of Urgenda, for example, has been 
that the Dutch state has been urged to take more ambitious ambitious action. Um, but as was pointed out also by the Dutch government, although rather ineptly <laughs> in the uh, litigation, was that doing that in the context of European climate policy actually doesn't necessarily lead to the kind of outcomes that we would expect if uh, the uh, Netherlands was not, not in this European context. Um, and I think um, I think the real challenge will be um, when we see those kind of uh, that kind of litigation at the European court rather than at the national courts as we're currently seeing. But um, and actually, to be I mean, this this is a longer discussion, but I, I feel that actually Urgenda would have been um, should have been referred to the ECJ um, rather than 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 kept in the Dutch courts. But that's obviously not what uh, what happened. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what the future brings. Thank you very much, uh, for the team. It's 12 past five, and uh, uh, we should go, uh, end that session by half past five. So we have a bit less than 20 minutes remaining. So we'll now give the floor uh, uh, to Amandine and uh, maybe po to, to Dirk, because there was a question for him. And we'll maybe have a, another round of questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for um, those very, very interesting questions. So, first of all, concerning the action plan um, for the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights, um, I do not have any clue of in which direction exactly the, the ongoing consultations and discussions are going. Uh, I find it uh, interesting that this um, action plan um, will come about. I think this is, um, it brings evidence that um, that you cannot only, you know, endorse or issue a catalog of principles and good intentions like what the pillar substantially is uh, without, um, you know, thinking more um, operationally of how, how it will work. Um, and even though the Commission has pushed a number of uh, regulatory legislative initiatives over the past few years, um, as far as the non-binding soft coordination um, aspect dimension of the pillar is concerned, obviously it is a lot more uh, complicated to see how you can bring national governments to take action to try and reach the objectives and, and make those rights uh, effective. So, um, so it is very, very uh, important and um, I hope it will uh, lead to tangible, um, tangible initiatives. Now, moving on to the second question, um, which is very interesting. I had never thought about it in those terms, to be honest, in terms of, uh, well, what percentage of the GDP or of the EU budget would, you know, need to um, be allocated to social issues to actually achieve those ambitious goals. Um, but to the question of whether we should increase the EU's resources or the EU budget, um, for now, my answer tends to be no, in the sense that, um, first, I think that with um, the resources of the European Social Fund, um, the resources of Next Generation EU and the Recovery Facility, and potential, let's add to that, possible new taxes on transnational uh, activities, um, which could be partly earmarked for social problems, we already have fairly substantial resources. And I would add to that that the idea, the kind of perspective I'm trying to, to give in the paper is not to argue for the setting up of a fully-fledged uh, European welfare state with uh, a kind with a proportion of the EU budget, you know, which would be just as important for social policy as what we can say at a national level. Um, that's why I tried to formulate this idea of a multi-layered um, social market economy where the EU has an important role to play, which should be fully uh, both legitimate and effective, but obviously will not become you know, the European equivalent of a national welfare state. Rather, it needs to um, fulfill a, um, a more accurate role in addressing um, those um, transnational activities and matching, if you want, um, the transnational dimension of capitalism with transnational action capacity. And I think that we do have 
sufficient resources to do a lot in that respect already with the current budget. Thank you very much. Uh, Dirk, maybe you can say something about the question that was more addressed to you. Thanks a lot again, Olivier. Maybe two uh, short remarks. One going back to the discussion we had previously about uh, multi-speed Europe and uh, the role of the internal market. I think there's a, um, you can uh, probably have both views. The internal market, for example, in, in uh, energy and in other sectors is the one that applies indeed to all member states in defining the need and eventually also the speed for phasing out of coal. Uh, that is true and that puts everybody in the same situation in the context of the Green Deal. But then um, there's also elements of the internal market which treat different member states differently, like the burden sharing regulation, which uh, factors in the relative poverty of some member states. And I think the Commission has done something very, very smart um, by going below the uh, layer of the member state and going, focusing, zooming into regions by looking at their special characteristics, coal regions um, get a treatment which does not depend where precisely they are located uh, and thus um, focusing a policy on really the areas where it matters and avoiding a multi-speed Europe. I think that was um, indeed a very smart move. Now, uh, when it comes to European champions, the question I was asked, um, I think that's an interesting question because it goes to the soul of our market economy. How do we define our market economy? Uh, we see that batteries, for example, are produced uh, by a large um, majority in Asia only, and we want to replicate that. And that poses a couple of questions. First of all is, how did Asia get to that success, that we all dependent on their batteries for our electromobility in the future? Um, you would assume that it was all the states um, who supported them, but that is actually not the case. Even in China, those uh, were business people who came up uh, with own ideas, with their own uh, startups, with their own um, business that developed into million dollar uh, projects. Um, we, uh, in replicating that, we have essentially, um, we're focusing on a European way. Uh, which is um, state intervention, in this case, even European intervention, bringing coalitions, alliances together, looking for exemptions and maybe modifications in our competition law and our state aid law, um, which makes you wonder um, where, why we must do it that particular way, uh, that rather interventionist way, whereas other continents uh, are building uh, their strive for national or continental champions on an entrepreneurship which we had in the first re uh, industrial revolution. We had all these people who came up with interventions, uh, with inventions, and they were located in Europe. That seems not to be the case yet. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, I will give back the floor to Alexander at the very end of our session, but uh, let's go now to Sasha for maybe another question. There are no further questions from the okay. audience. I have a question, uh, and I'm not sure um, our guests can answer to this one very, very quickly. My point with all that is about that. Uh, to which extent can we think about the main orientation of the EU for the next decades in terms of policies, the Green Deal, social policies, the, the market, without taking into account the political equilibria within the various EU institutions. So to, to, to say things in another way, uh, is it possible to give priority to environmental or to social policy in a political system in which the, all the institutions are dominated by the EPP? So uh, can we ensure that just playing with institution if people continue to vote for the right wing? Who wants to answer to this one? Amandine, I'm sure. This is a both very interesting and very difficult one, of course, uh, which is hard to answer in a, in a few minutes. But, um, well, my spontaneous uh, answer would be no. I mean, the EU, we know that the EU is, has been many times depicted as a conservative political system, meaning not uh, that it's a fully EPP, but meaning where it's hard to 
uh, push groundbreaking projects uh, and not only institutional reforms, but also a little bit more uh, radical, let's say, policy agendas uh, forward uh, for particular uh, reasons. Um, and also on simple democratic grounds, uh, I was also arguing in my presentation and, um, and in my paper that uh, such an agenda, which requires the investment of public uh, resources, which requires taxation, uh, which are obviously uh, redistributive choices, have to be collectively made on much more solid democratic grounds. And this, um, with this, I mean not only uh, small scale participatory uh, experiments, uh, but actually uh, tangible, effective and systematic parliamentary uh, and control and representative mechanisms. Thank you. Maybe, Josephine, on that balance between institutional design and politics. Oh, yeah, I tend to look at environment because I like to steer away from this question, but um, uh, no, I think it's a very good point. And I, yeah, I've just been thinking about it also based on what um, Amandine just mentioned. And actually, the first thing that uh, your question triggered with me was not one of, of uh, the influence of uh, specific uh, political parties, but actually of the balance between the institutions, the European institutions right now, when we look at the field of environmental policy. And I'm particularly thinking about Article 1922, which um, identifies certain areas of environmental policy where um, we are subject to a special legislative procedure and actually the parliament is no longer involved and we see unanimity voting in the council. And I think actually a lot of those areas are, are really key to um, some of the ambitions of the, of the Green Deal. I'm thinking about land use. I'm thinking obviously about the use of natural resources as also mentioned by Dirk. And I think, um, uh, you know, not wanting to sidestep your question, but I mean, I think that's also a very, very important uh, issue because, you know, to really have progress on on some of those on some of those those areas, and there even this maybe slightly less. Um, I mean, obviously, energy everybody's aware of, uh, but there's also very important questions about land use and forestry, which really speak to the heart of how we're going to restore and preserve the environment in in Europe, and are are, are crucially important that they're now uh, finally included in this way. But for in order to, to, for those to move forward. We do need to see a change in in uh, competence, or at least the use of competence, uh, from what we see now. And actually, I, just to go back one second um, uh, to a point that was raised earlier, but I didn't have time to comment on before. Um, one of the other things of the Green Deal, which is perhaps not as sexy and therefore not as visible, is the fact that uh, the climate law that we referred to um, earlier also introduces new powers for the Commission to take a massive amount of quasi-legislative action um, to continuously update and uh, change uh, the climate goals that are being set under that climate law, which are binding, um, uh, in line with, for instance, changes to the Paris Agreement. Now, that is that is something which has been raised as a concern in terms of how democratic is the delegation of that kind of extensive powers to the Commission. Um, at the same time, the Green Deal also, and it's no harm pledge, which is a little bit, I think, confusing in its terminology, uh, uh, emphasizes that it wants to make even more use of the better regulation uh, agenda and really wants to make everything even more transparent and, and open. So, sorry, this is not exactly a question, a question of uh, maybe the political uh, part of the institutions, but I do think there are a lot of institutional changes and a lot of institutional um, uh, dynamics that, that obviously affect uh, these agendas very, very heavily. Yeah. Thank you. Dirk, do you want to, to react quickly? Yeah, on this very point? briefly, yeah. I, I don't really see that danger. I'm hopeful that this danger will not materialize that you're mentioning, Olivier, um, because precisely because we are not doing this in a European bubble. Uh, there is a, a global competition now about a, a change in industry from an old fashioned industry um, to a new industry. And I, I do hope that even um, the most hardcore conservative would not watch the continent uh, de-industrialize de and not be able to catch up uh, with our neighbors. Thank you, Sasha. There is a final question uh, from the floor. Um, can we force companies that receive funds through the Green Deal 
to commit themselves to not make redundant their workers. Who can answer this one? Um, well, so yes, so just this is slightly speculative because we haven't actually seen the final plans on this. I don't think that at the moment the the view is to prevent redundancies because I think you know part of this transformation is having to accept that certain sectors are simply no longer going to be viable in this sort of new economy that we're envisaging. Um, but there is a very heavy emphasis on education and re-education of workers in certain sectors in order for them to have at least equally good employment opportunities elsewhere. So I don't think a, um, but you know, of course we don't know this yet, but I don't think, um, uh, I don't expect the um, uh, a condition for funding would be to not uh, make redundant co um, uh, workers, but rather to to retrain them into a different into a different sector. Thank you very much. Uh, before concluding, I will give back the floor to Alexander for some, some words of conclusion. Well, thank you so much. I think it was really in inspiring today, um, hearing all these, these uh, different things on, on this topic. And um, I, I maybe have two things to, to end this with. Uh, first of all, also in relation to, to your last question, I think it is uh, also important if we look two weeks back um, at the elections for the German Conservative Parties, uh, con Conservative Party, that the ultra conservative neoliberal revolution did not happen. And um, that um, with um, Ami Laschet now, that there is uh, someone in place uh, who will not reverse certain policies and, and will continue this, uh, this agenda. Um, and at the same time, I do think, uh, also in relation to, to your last question, it is important that we keep on reminding everyone, politicians, uh, managers, academics, um, that this is one of the, the most pressing needs and that we do see an opportunity here. I mean, there is no reason in looking back and say, oh, should have, could have, would have, but um, we should now look into the future and um, take what we have, take this opportunity. Um, of course, it's a disastrous situation that we are in with the, with the COVID pandemic and the climate crisis, but it also gives us the chance now to, to move forward, to get ready for for the next decades, and uh, I think it's it's all our duty to to remind politicians every day to not forget about this and to keep this um, on the on top of the the agenda. Thank you very much, Alexander, for the excellent words of conclusion. I would like to thank you very warmly, all our participants uh, this afternoon, and everyone who was uh, online. Uh, tomorrow, as we know, as you know, we start again at nine sharp uh, to continue on policies with external policy and trade policy, and then we'll move to uh, the polities, to the EU institutions, uh, decision making, citizens' elections. Uh, so uh, now, uh, since we are all at home, uh, maybe you can have a drink and, and discuss the Green Deal or social policy with your partner or your neighbor. And uh, we'll meet again tomorrow morning. Thank you so much.